Blessings in the name of the Lord. I pray that you are blessed wherever you are, whoever you're with, be it in your home or listening at some future date to this. I want to ask you a question. Do you know of anyone, your family, friends, perhaps even yourself, that suffers from depression? Depression is one of the fastest growing statistically problems that we have medically in our society today. And it's sad but true that the statistics run equally within the church or the body of Christ. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. If you have a Bible, I want you to join me, if you would, in Psalm 34. Psalm 34. I believe that deliverance can be one of the most misdiagnosed problems that we have. And one of the great sad facts is that within the body of Christ, there seems to be no barrier to whom it affects. I've been reading lately about this increase in suicide, even among pastors. I just recently read the sad story of a young pastor, a very, very large church, beautiful wife and small family, and he took his life. Including his wife, no one had a clue. He didn't appear to be, nor did he express in any way that he was depressed, that there were problems. The church was growing. Financially, they were well off. And he personally showed no indication of any depression or problems that he had in his life. And to this day, there is still questions among those who loved him, what happened in his life. I want to address depression from a Bible standpoint. And I want to say as a disclaimer before I begin, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychologist, but I want to approach this as a pastor because I believe there is much truth in the Word of God about depression. And yet it may take a bit of revelation to see it. Uh, there are modern terms and words we use today that if we don't find that same term in the Bible, then we feel like it is something that's just not addressed. And so I want to show you a few things today in hopes that you or those you love that are suffering from this debilitating disease that can lead to such despair that one would take their life. We are living in an environment right now with circumstances in multiple forms that is only increasing the amount of depression that we have in our world. Psalm 34. We're going to listen to a great man of God who in multiple places throughout the Psalms expressed his own struggle and battle with depression. So in Psalm 34, I want to begin at verse 15. It says, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. But he says, the face of the Lord is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. But the righteous cry and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. Verse 18 he says, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. And he saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. And then he finishes by saying, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. I want to talk to you today in for the next few moments about something God has laid on my heart and dealt with me even personally about. Actually, I only got a couple hours sleep last night because 
every time I tried to, the Lord would wake me up and I'd go back to my office and he would take me deeper into this for myself personally. And so let's just share together and see if God can't show you what he's been showing me so that we all can be, as the title of the message is, delivered from depression. Now, if you search the Bible, you're not going to find the word depression or being depressed. But there are several places where this same concept of being depressed is expressed in Scripture. So I want you to look with me again at verse 18 that we just read. This is Psalm 34, 18. It says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. I want you to notice the words broken heart, an oft-repeated word in both Old and New Testament. Often it's used together as the broken-hearted. We're told that God is nigh, and he even delivers us from that. Now, if you're taking notes, that word broken heart, those two words are actually one word in Hebrew, and it's the word shabar. S-H-A-B-A-R. And literally it means to be weighted down with grief. Weighted down, brokenhearted, depressed, crushed. Shabar or broken hearted. Now I want you to Take note of something very important. When we talk about someone who is depressed, today would be defined as clinically depressed. We're not talking about someone who is grieving, someone who's just recently lost a loved one, maybe received uh, the unfortunate news that they've lost their job or uh, some tragic news about a loved one. They will be brokenhearted, but this moves beyond that into depression when it continues. You see, there is a period of grieving that is normal. We're supposed to weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice. There's nothing uh, abnormal about going through the pain of grief for a period. Even secular psychologists teach that there are stages and phases of grief, but it's not to continue without end. Now, when it does, when this broken or heavy heart continues, and then it seems to come for no reason at all, now we're talking about what today even doctors would call depression. No doctor would say, well, if you just lost your mother uh, and you're you're having uh, these serious dark days, they would understand that this is something that will pass. It won't be easy, but it'll take time. But it's still not depression. It's a very normal grieving. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about something that continues. And so I want you to Take note also that he even goes on to say that the Lord delivers us out of them all. In other words, there is deliverance from a broken heart. Many places in Scripture, Jesus said, that's what I was called to do, to heal the broken hearted. And what I want to talk to you about today is, first of all, showing you two forms of or two sources of depression that often go undiagnosed and therefore cannot be treated properly. And so to do that, if you would, turn with me to, in fact, if you want to mark your place, we'll be coming back in a few moments to uh, two chapters away from this. It'll save you having to find it. Uh, But right now I'd like you, if you have a Bible, to join me in 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. And I'm going to show you one of the uh, very deceptive schemes 
of Satan to bring about depression. Now again, disclaimer, I'm not a doctor and therefore I'm not going to dismiss or even try to discuss with you the uh, problems sometimes with chemical imbalances in the brain. I'm not a psychiatrist that's going to try and dig back into your past and find out whether you were properly uh, rocked or hugged by your parents. But as a pastor, I'm going to show you two major causes of depression that the Bible speaks about and that Jesus came to deliver us from. Second Peter chapter 2. Prior to verse 7 in the first six verses, there's discussion that includes how God had to destroy, because of sin, Sodom and Gomorrah. If you remember, Lot and his wife and family lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, a place, a city known for its not only evil, but its cultural acceptance of evil. No city on the planet then or now without sin, crime, and problems. But what singled out Sodom and Gomorrah was that it had reached a level of iniquity that was so far beyond repair, Bible would call it reprobate, that there was nothing left but to eliminate it lest it spread and continue. But the issue behind it becoming reprobate or beyond repair was because it was an accepted cultural norm to live in their iniquitous lifestyle of sin. So with that in mind, Peter makes a point here that's often overlooked, and that's in verse 7. Now this is 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. It says that God delivered, watch this now, remember, delivered just, just law. He was a righteous man. Not perfect, but he was righteous. That's what it means, just. It says, but God delivered just Lot, who was, and here's the word I want you to underline. We're going to talk about it a little bit. And delivered just Lot, who was vexed with the filthy conversation. The word conversation there means lifestyle, not just their talk. That's part of it. But he was vexed with the filthy lifestyle of the wicked that he lived in the midst of. For it goes on to say in verse 8, for the, that righteous man, Lot, dwelling among, notice that, dwelling among them in seeing and hearing, he again, same word, was vexed. It vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Lot made a decision, a bad choice, when Abraham chose otherwise to move away from the wicked city of Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible says Lot cast his tent towards there. There were certain advantages. The pastures were easier. It was less rocky and hilly, and he could handle his uh, uh, sheep in that area much better. And oftentimes that's what draws us into a dangerously sinful environments is because uh, it's easy sometimes even more pleasurable for the flesh. But this word vexed is a very, very fascinating word. It literally means, if you want to just jot this down, depressed. He was vexed in the midst of them from day to day. The word means disturbed, distressed, it has something to do with being pressed down. Something that he sees and hears that he knows, listen now, he knows it's not right, it's evil. And although he's personally not participating in it, it's still having an impact on him to where literally he's vexed or depressed. Now, that's what I call the outward source of depression. What was going on around him, called sin, in a culture where it was accepted, he saw it, the Bible says he heard it and saw it every day. And a good interpretation would be, and it depressed him. 
Now, with that in mind, Daniel, you can just jot this down. We're not going to take time to turn there, but in Daniel chapter 7, uh, verses 25 and 26, where Daniel is speaking about the end times, about the Antichrist, about what will take place during that time, he makes a very interesting statement. He says, because of the swelling words of the spirit of Antichrist, another way of saying that, because of the things being said and done in society from the spirit of Satan himself, it said it would cause the saints of God to be worn out. It would be the wearing out or the wearing down of the saints. Now, again, without taking time to go into that, uh, the Hebrew there, I believe it's the Hebrew word bala, and it's similar to the New Testament word vexed, meaning that there was something about the work of the enemy, Satan's scheme, to increase unlaw or lawlessness in society, that it's going to have an effect on we who are believers. And it will have such an effect that it will wear them down. Now that Hebrew word, again, could be interpreted in today's language as it would depress them. Press them down. It literally becomes like a weight. Any wonder we're told in the New Testament that we're to lay aside not only sin, but every weight that doth so easily beset us. If you took a bowling ball and threw it in the middle of your bed, it would create a what? A depression. Why? Because of the weight. And many times it's not sin in our own lives, but many times it's the sin around us and the weight of how that impacts us that can cause us to be worn out, depressed. You know, one thing I found clinically that they say, almost without exception, someone who's clinically depressed always suffers from and battles fatigue. Not because necessarily they're overworked, it's just an unexplainable weariness. It's that, that feeling that some of you know what I'm talking about when you want to just go to bed the middle of the day, pull the covers over your head and hope tomorrow's better. And when that becomes something that happens day by day by day, it's called depression. And it can lead to such depths of despair that one will consider death. The spirit of Antichrist is at work in our world today. First John chapter three tells us that. And around us, we are just like Lot. We are seeing and hearing increased levels of blasphemous sin. We're seeing people that are marching in the streets, and I've seen with my own eyes signs that say, as incredible as this is, marching with this angry look in their face with signs that say, if Jesus comes again, we'll kill him again. Now, if that doesn't vex your spirit, then you're not born again. And if we don't know how to deal with that vexation, then we too as believers will have an unexplainable increase of depression by seeing and hearing that wears us out, fatigues us, grieves us. And that's what I call coming from the outside because in a moment we're gonna look at what happens on the inside, the source of depression from within our own lives. But don't miss this point now. Lot is living in a society that is increasing in such iniquity and mockery of God and his word that it has to be destroyed, literally to the point where God has to get them out of there because he's going to destroy Sodom, but he wants to save Lot. It has an impact on us. We hear about it, we see it, and we're grieved and rightfully should be but not to the point it causes depression. You say, well, Brother West, what do we do about it? Uh, sometimes it's unavoidable. I don't watch the news anymore and I have to, but sometimes just uh, walking uh, through a mall, a store, uh, hearing this and seeing that, and, and we realize that Satan's at work. 
things that our political leaders are saying are beyond belief to bring us in a direction that is so far from God that uh, it would shock our grandmothers or great-grandmothers if they weren't here to see this. Now, as I say, in a moment, we're going to get to the uh, prescription, the antidote, but I want to properly diagnose this so that uh, most of us, I feel, cannot deny or defer this as something that they don't struggle with. And I'll show you exactly what I mean. Now, that's the outward effect on wearing out the saints. And yet there's also an inward source of depression. And I'll show you that if you want to go back to where we were, Psalm 34, we're going to go two chapters prior and look at Psalm 32. This is Psalm 32, and we're going to begin at verse 1. David said, Blessed is he whose transgression, sin, is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and whose spirit there is no guile. We'll come back to that in a minute. But listen to verse 3. David said, when I kept silence, my bones, underline this, waxed old. My bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. He says, for day and night thy hand was heavy upon me, and my moisture is turned into the drought of summer. In other words, I've, I've wept so much that uh, I can't even cry anymore. Selah. Now, when you look at verse number three, David says something so revealing here. He says, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old. Those words there, waxed old, come from the Hebrew word kataponos, which means to be pressed down, heavy laden. A modern term would be depression. So what's he saying here? He's saying he was depressed, but what was he depressed about? Well, the context of this entire psalm, as well as Psalm 51, is David crying out to God in repentance for his multiple sins that began with an adulterous affair with Bathsheba, which moved into murder, cover-up, lying, and David makes an amazingly revelatory statement here when he says, look at it again, verse 3, when I kept silence, my bones waxed old. Let me say it this way. When I didn't deal with the sin I'd committed, I lived in depression. Depression that finally turned to where I didn't even cry about it anymore. And yet, my bones waxed old or kataponos. I was pressed down with depression. Why? Because he kept silent. Now, what does that mean, I kept silence? Now, we don't know all the details about what happened after David's sin, but what we do know, and theologians uh, vary on the time period, but it's apparent that David, after he had sinned multiple times in this whole sad scenario where adultery led to having the woman's husband killed, who was a good man, cover, trying to cover his sin. That's what he meant by silent. I covered up my sin during the, the entire evil episode. And then afterwards, and this is important now, afterwards, we don't know exactly how, but apparently he was keeping silent about it. Or in other words, he, he didn't want anybody to know. He covered it up. He may have been in denial, minimized it. Hey, I'm king. I mean, there, I have a certain right to, to things in my kingdom. Maybe he did, as many do today, and say, well, there's others that have done this. It's not the end of the world, and uh, God knows uh, I'm a good man, and uh, he uses me. I'm, I'm a great king. I'm won a lot of battles and whatever the, the gymnastics that went on in his brain, all we know is that he kept silent by his own testimony. 
Did he confess it to God even? Or did he keep silent? The cover-up, silence. And he said, because of that, during the time I was doing that, he said, I was experiencing a waxing old or a fatiguing depression. Now, how do we know that? Because the next verse gives us the key. Look at verse 5. David said, but when I acknowledge my sin, oh, so this depression was caused because he wasn't acknowledging his sin, covering it up, minimizing it, denying it, blaming it on someone else. Maybe he blamed it on Bathsheba. I'm just a man and she shouldn't have been on a roof taking a bath. But he said, but when I acknowledged and I quit keeping silent or covering up or not confessing my sin, he said, then I lived in daily depression. But then when I acknowledge my sin unto thee, O Lord, when I acknowledge my sin and my iniquity, he says, I haven't hid it. Well, there you go. Apparently he was hiding it. He said, I acknowledge my sin unto thee and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. God forgave him, but only when he confessed it. Now let's talk about that for a minute because we're at the very crux of, I believe, something that can help so many believers. It's helped me. I, I, I'm not embarrassed to tell you that I've had not one but many times bouts of unexplainable depression, a darkness that just settles in. It's, it's helped for me to read, as I, I do prolifically, of great men of God, Charles Finney and, and, and other ministers, some modern-day ministers that I know personally that you may not know because they wouldn't confide in many, but told me, they said, you know, there are days uh, that I just can't explain why I, I'm just depressed. And, and I try and get through that day, and, and hopefully the next day will be better. And sometimes they'll suffer that for days on end or a week or two. And so we as believers are not immune to that, but I believe it's time that we pull the covers off of the shame and deal with it from a Bible standpoint. So let's get the picture now. David has sinned and David's covered it up. David's not dealt with it in his own mind. Notice he said, but when I finally confess, which means something was going on in his thinking to where he wasn't confessing. Remember that word confess. The Greek word for confess is euaglion. It means say the same thing God says. So if God says it's adultery, if David's not confessing, he's calling it something else. Well, I was a victim of a woman uh, seducing me. Uh, today we take it even further. Well, everybody does that. That's the norm. It's the culture. Kind of like what happened to Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. It was the culture he lived around. And yet in this case... The source of depression is coming from his own sin. Now, when we look back at Lot, and I believe you'll find this in, in Matthew 24, where we have one of the second shortest verse in the Bible. First one, Jesus wept. The second one is, remember Lot's wife. Well, what can we remember about Lot's wife? And actually, the verse before that, he repeats, Second Peter, that Lot, his righteous soul was vexed day to day in Sodom. God tells Lot to leave Sodom and don't even look back. And yet as they're leaving, he and his family and his wife, Lot's wife looks back. And you remember the story? She instantly was turned to a pillar of salt. Now, why did Jesus tell us to remember that? Because there's a lesson in that. Remember, they lived in an evil culture. There's every indication that Lot never became a part of or a partaker in their sinful lifestyle in Sodom. But there's some questions about Lot's wife. Why? Because as they leave, Lot's not coming back, has no desire to go back there. He was depressed day after day living there. However, Lot's wife looks back. The indication there is there's something back there she didn't want to leave. 
There were some things that she at least not only was attracted to, but perhaps even participated in. Why else would you not want to go back? She looked yearningly back at a sin culture that God told him to leave. And she turned to a pill of salt. So we're talking about two things here that can cause depression. The environment around us, as the spirit of Antichrist increases the iniquity level of society to where it began with, yes, there's always been abortions, but we knew it was wrong and there was shame and you hid from it. Number two, then we just said, well, in early stages, and now it's advanced to the point where our culture now is demanding that that baby be able to be killed even after it's born if the doctor and mother agree. The rising tide of iniquity and it will have an impact on us. Daniel 7, 29. That spirit, that evil spirit of Antichrist in this system from the God or of this world, Satan, it will continue to wear down saints, fatigue them, depress them, unless we know how to deal with it. Again, we'll get there in a moment, but I don't want you to miss this. I don't want anybody to step aside and say, well, he's not talking about me because... Uh, I don't really know of any sin in my life. I'm not like Lot's wife. Listen, it's just living around it's going to have an impact on you. And we need to know how to deal with that. So, with that also in mind, let's go to, uh, well, let me just quote you some scripture. We'll not take time to turn there. There's another word that's, often used. In fact, it's one of our most common words in Christianity, and yet you may be shocked to find out it's, it's not even in the Bible. The principle is, but we don't have that word. And that's the word conviction. You say, Brother West, that's not in the Bible? No, actually it's not in uh, the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 8, verse 9, uh, where the story of the woman caught in adultery is brought before uh, this religious crowd. And they want to stone her. And Jesus says, and I'm paraphrasing the entire story. He says, well, if you're without sin, you can go ahead and cast the first stone. Now listen to the next verse. It says, but immediately they were convicted in their conscience. Now that's the closest we can come to the word conviction anywhere in the Bible. Because actually that very word used there and elsewhere uh, is not convict, but it's what that word means. The Greek word means to convince in fact, most new translations quote it that way. In John chapter 16, we're told when the Holy Spirit comes, one of his jobs will be to convince, convict, but the word there is convince the world of sin. Well, that's what conviction is. But I like the original meaning because it helps us understand what true conviction is. So now listen carefully. The only reason that Lot is depressed because of the environment and the culture of evil around him, similar to what we're living in now. The only reason he's depressed is because there's a conviction or a convincing, meaning that he is convinced that what he's living around is wrong. And he's not going to lower his standard just to meet the culture. And so it depresses him. His wife wasn't depressed because it appears she rose with the tide of iniquity, at least in agreement, if not participation. So get the point now. Conviction is God's gift that he gave us for spiritual pain. For the same reason God gave us nerve endings that can sense pain, so to protect us that if we happen to mistakenly lay our hand on a hot stove, God lovingly gave us a gift called pain that would cause us to remove from the source of damage. Did you know that conviction is God's gift of spiritual pain? If you've ever been under conviction, then you know uh, it's not a pleasant experience, but it is a gift. It is something that God gives us as pain on the inside that should bring us to a change that will eliminate that inward depression, pain of conviction. Now, here's what happens in society. And we're talking about 
present day society. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ has been trying to deal with spiritual depression, or in other words, conviction that can lead to condemnation. But listen carefully now. We're just talking about conviction, something that the Holy Spirit is involved in. That's what he does. We get off the path of righteousness. He loves us enough. He will send that pain called conviction to get us back off that dangerous path, to get our hand off that hot stove deep inside the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But if we ignore that pain, first of all, it won't go away. God loves us enough that if we continue in an unrighteous lifestyle, as believers, we have this knower inside. It's called our conscience. It means the the self-knowing. And since we know ourselves what God's word says and we see it around us, it brings depression. We'll deal with that in a minute, how to eliminate that. But more importantly, David said, I... I had my bones waxing cold. He goes on to say, through my roaring all day long. That word roaring there means groaning. He said, basically, if I can paraphrase, he said, because I was minimizing what I had done, I wasn't acknowledging it. I wasn't confessing it. He said, then there was a groaning in my spirit all day long, every day. Or in other words, I lived in depression. Can I just make it as painfully simple as possible. When we live as believers with unconfessed sin, we are destined to live our days in depression. Now you say, well, I know a lot of people that are living in sin, Brother Wesson, and they don't have depression. Well, let me explain to you why. Because they're treating it the wrong way. Living in sin and having no uh, weight, having no bala having no roaring in their spirit, having no broken heart, beaten down, crushed. It's because they've been served an anesthetic. It doesn't remove the condition, it just takes the pain away. We do it through drugs, alcohol, illicit sexual activity. I could go on and on because the list Uh, is it being added to, it seems, as we speak. But even the church as a whole, hear me carefully, has not dealt with this subject properly. So let me explain to you this way. If I'm struggling, if I'm struggling, let's just take something that won't be as painful but maybe we can all identify with. If I'm struggling with gluttony, I can't control my weight. I'm reaching a point where not only it's affecting my health, but it's just a bad testimony. That means there's something we're out of control in. Well, there's two different extreme camps in the body of Christ that would tell you how to deal with that. If I'm addicted to heroin. There's two camps of the church, two extremes that'll tell you how to deal with it. Now this camp over here, we'll call it legalism. Some of you know what that means. They are stuck on the law. The legalistic camp in this extreme will tell you, you got that problem? Then just stop. How many of you know that doesn't help much? And usually the very ones are telling you to stop haven't been able to themselves. Actually, that's what Jesus said one time to the Pharisees. He said, you lay heavy burdens on people that you yourselves don't carry. But you put on a religious smile and uh, tell everybody else what they should do. You know, it's interesting that that's what happened to David. When David was living with this denial or minimizing of the sin he went through, God sent a prophet named Nathan to him. Now watch how this works. Let's apply this in a clinical way to depression. David's in denial. David has covered his sin. Or he said it this way, when I kept silent until I acknowledged and confessed, he lived in a depression that caused groaning inside of him until God sent a prophet named Nathan who told him this story about 
a rich man with many sheep that went and stole the only sheep that belonged to this one poor man. And Nathan asked King David, he said, what should we do to that man? David said, he should be executed. And then Nathan turned and looked at him. He said, you're the man. Thou art the man. And suddenly in that moment, David's eyes were opened. You say, well, certainly he knew he, he was living in sin. Listen, that's how subtle this thing is. As culture changes, the dangers we slowly change with it. When you hear that word wax to W-A-X-E-D, that the love many will wax cold because of the iniquitous or sinful society. It means gradually. That's what that word means. Wax gradually. So gradually we can either adjust to the culture around us and little by little accept the sin that they are practicing as being, well, everybody does it. It's the norm. It's not that bad. And that's what's happened to us. And yet we don't realize the Holy Spirit's going to come and convict us. And now we've got one or two things to do. We go to the legalists and they just say, well, quit. Well, we tried and we couldn't, so we said, that doesn't work. Well, then we go to the other extreme, which I say without apology, could be the grace revolution. Wow, that one's much more comfortable because over here they don't tell me to quit. They tell me it doesn't matter. Don't do it, don't matter. And there's variations in between. No, it does matter, but just to tell someone to quit isn't the answer. We'll get there in a minute. But to tell someone even worse, that listen, listen, don't worry about sin. God's grace has got you covered. Well, that sounds good and is true, but it also can open up the door for there to be a, as First Peter calls it, a searing of the conscience with a hot iron. Searing, cauterizing taking flesh that normally would be sensitive and have feeling or feel pain. But once it's been cauterized with a hot iron, now there's no pain there. And now we can live without pain. Let me give you a couple examples. I've been counseling for over 30 years. And there's a phrase that I began to realize was so common and popular that I began to wonder if this was being shared and passed around. Typical example, I'll have a couple come in. I'm thinking one in particular where the husband and wife came in. The reason for coming in was the wife uh, had on numerous occasions caught the husband uh, looking at pornography. And so as she tearfully explains how this is crushing her and, and ruining their marriage, at some point I turn to the husband and as graciously as I can, I ask him, what do you have to say about that? Now listen to what a very common response I heard multiple times. Instead of just confessing, as David finally did, the answer came this way. Well, listen, if my wife took care of me, then I wouldn't have to do that. But since she's not doing what she should do, I have a legitimate right to do what I'm doing. Now do you see the principle involved here? Same thing that happened with David. There is a justification, at least a minimization or minimalizing it, and also blaming it on the wife. So therefore, I don't have anything to confess. I am not guilty. I'm a victim. And that's why I do it. And then they make this statement. And so Brother Wes... I have a peace about it. Do you know how many times I heard that said? I began to wonder if they're reading a book somewhere that's giving them a peace about it, and that becomes the mantra. I have a peace about it. No, you don't have a peace about it. You have a cauterized conscience that no longer feels pain, and you call it peace. Doesn't bother me anymore. And it may be because you go to a church where they never present it to you. There's nothing to be bothered about. God just loves you and that's all you hear. And they will cherry pick verses about how God has a plan for you. And uh, he loves you unconditionally. God forgives. Yes, he does. All of that is true. But listen, you can't treat a disease if you don't diagnose it. And if you're just telling somebody, don't worry about it. It's like giving someone who's got a burst appendix 
two aspirin. Tell them to go home and sleep. You've not only not diagnosed the problem, you've not given them the answer. And many times today, we pastors are guilty of helping to anesthetize a very legitimate conscience that causes pain, and we so want them not to live in pain. We want them to leave our service and walk out our church doors after a sermon and feel what they would call blessed, or in some cases, what they really mean is unconvicted, never challenged about what the Word of God says. You know, the book of James talks about this in depth. He says, when we look into the Word of God, the Bible, it becomes like a mirror, and we see what man or man we are. Paraphrase, we see what God says about how we should live, and yet it mirrors the fact that we're not. Now, that's not to condemn us. That's to give us a standard by which our conscience can operate. Because he goes on to say, after we look and we see what needs to change, then we walk away and we forget what manner of man we just saw. So imagine if we can just read God's word and hear his standards that grieve our spirit when we see the opposite being not only said and done, but voted on and becoming laws of our land. Any wonder that depresses us. And so what Satan will get you to do is, first of all, just look here occasionally, walk away, and, and pretty soon the pain of that conviction will leave. How much more so if you never read it? then only culture can determine for you what's right and wrong. What happens when someone who is your pastor only picks and chooses the parts that will never address the problem called sin? So what is the very bacterial microscopic problem of all depression? It's called sin. Sin in the world around us when we want to allow our conscience to convict us of what's going on. Sin in our own lives that creates a God-given gift of pain that means we need to deal with this and not just find some pulpit that will minister a spiritual drug that will take that pain away. Sin, whether it's in the world around us, or within our own lives is what we need the antidote from. You know, 1 John makes a very strange statement when he says that there's a certain sin that's unto death. He says there are some sins that aren't, but there is a sin unto death. I've been asked that question uh, multiple times through the years. And I, the Lord just gave me a simple way to answer them. What is a sin unto death, Brother Wes? It's a sin you intend to do till you die. In other words, you've already closed the case on it. I'm not going to be convicted anymore. I no longer feel any pain of conviction. Why? Because my pastor doesn't talk about it. In fact, he told me there's enough grace to cover it. Everybody does it. Not my fault. If she didn't do that, if he didn't do this. So in other words, there are certain sins that we've allowed Satan to give us all the mental gymnastics to excuse it as something that we don't need to change. So it becomes a sin that I have said, I'm going to do this to the day I die. Because you see, the difference is as long as we, 1 John 1, 9, confess what David finally did to get free of depression. He said, as long as I didn't confess, he said, I was in depression every day. But he said, as soon as I confessed, he said, suddenly God delivered me. And he will, not only from that, but he goes on to say two chapters later, from all my afflictions, from all the attacks against me, from my broken, crushed, depressed heart, all my bones waxing old, gradually getting more and more depressed. Why? Because I refuse to deal with the source of the pain. I'm not going to cover it up. I'm not going to try and anesthetize it. Don't want somebody to tell me that it's okay. God's word reminds me every time I open it, I'm not like him. And in fact, this is something I need to deal with. And then we ask God for his help. So now, let me kind of wrap this by saying to you that the, the answer is, 
as the problem is twofold, sin around us and sin within us can cause depression. I'm going to give you a twofold prescription. Write it down. It may sound simplistic, but I'm going to elaborate for a little longer on this and help you because it's more important that you not just understand this, but that you find deliverance from depression. Number one, pray about it. And Brother West, well, we all know we should pray. No, please listen to me. When there is something the Holy Spirit is convicting you in your life, you know it's in God's word. You're aware of it. Your conscience, your knower knows it hasn't been seared yet. Why? First of all, maybe you've got a good pastor that's not afraid to preach against sin because it makes Calvary more wonderful. You don't need the blood of Jesus to cover sin that you don't acknowledge as sin. So what I'm saying to you is you're not even going to pray about it if you don't think it's a problem. You know, this spirit of Antichrist that Daniel said would wear out the saints, I felt like the Holy Spirit showed me something about that. And that is, until you understand that, you don't know how to pray against the spirit around you. We often just wait for those moments of crisis when a hurricane is three, four hours out. Suddenly we go to our knees and we want to pray. But do we pray for God's strength and protection against the culture around us that's affecting us without us even realizing it. So sin is the problem. God's forgiveness is the antidote. So if you are aware that there's something in your life that God wants to see changed, then the pain of that conviction is resolved first of all and foremost by praying about it. Let me show you the secret to praying about it. First of all, before you pray about it, you're going to be acknowledging it's something I need to pray about. Otherwise, you don't pray about it because it's not sin. I'm going to do that till I die. I don't need to pray about that. There's nothing wrong with that. So you pray about it. In praying about it, you are immediately confessing and acknowledging, God, this is not what your word says. It's not what's in my life. And I ask you to forgive me. And then you do good. That's what Jesus said. Pray about it and do good. What did he say in Matthew chapter 5? He said, even if you have enemies, he told them, do those two things. He said, then pray for your enemies. Pray about it. Pray for them. And then two, do good for them. You realize you could paraphrase that as saying, whenever there's something evil, an enemy would be evil, when you see here, as Lot did, evil around you, and yet, instead of letting it depress you, pray for them, and even do good for them. Do you know when I hear some of the nonsense from some politicians today that think that the answer to society is to take us in the direction of communist China or Venezuela or Cuba or these nations that have proven it doesn't work. Anti-God and anti-biblical principles. When I hear that, I have learned, and trust me, it's a, an ongoing lesson. I've learned to, if I just listen and allow anger to rise inside of me, frustration, groaning, as David called it, then I will begin to experience depression. Now, I've heard some preachers say, and I think I've said it myself, uh, just turn it off. Well, I've got a better prescription for you. When you see these things, pray for them. You know, I pray for Nancy Pelosi. I don't pray she dies. I pray she'll come to the truth, come to the light of Jesus. I pray for Chuck Schumer. I pray for any and all politicians that go contrary to the principles of God's word. And the first thing that does is it shields me from my spirit being so disturbed that I can begin to live in depression as it increases, seeing and hearing what they're doing. Then do good. Don't just pray about it. Do something about it. What can I do about it, Brother West? Well, one thing you can do is vote. Another thing you can do is don't shy away or back away from uh, compromising when someone asks you a question or presents their position that they think, I don't see anything wrong with pro-choice. Well, then you have to make a decision. Are you going to let your light shine and lovingly say, well, I respect the fact that that's how you feel. However, I believe the Bible says thou shalt not kill. 
and it doesn't matter the age of the individual. So you pray, and you do something. When I see homeless people, and I see the evil that is put, some of these people, not just the ones with mental illness, but with addictions and problems, and they're living in this hard situation, I don't just look at it and let it depress me. I pray every time I go by one, Lord, is this somebody you want me to help? And oftentimes I'll be led to stop, roll down the window, give them a couple of dollars and tell them Jesus still loves them. You pray and you do something about it. Now, when you see sin in your own life, what do you do? You pray and you do something about it. Now, when I say pray, the secret to that is that means you are acknowledging this hasn't changed yet. And so therefore, Father, I'm going to continue to pray about this until I change. I'm not going to allow my heart to be hard and say, you know what, I'm tired of this. I, I, I'm going to quit. I, I'm not going to let it bother me anymore. I have a peace about it. No, the good news is that as long as you're honest and confess, say what God says in his word, he's faithful and just, 1 John 1, 9, to forgive you and he will cleanse you. That may not be in a moment's time. It may not be in the next few days. But if you'll continually go back to God and say, God, you know what? This hasn't changed in my life, but I'm not going to be depressed because I'm going to say to you again, continue to help me, Lord. Continue to give me the grace to see a change in my life. But you see, a lot of people, and I know this through counseling, say, well, Brother Wes, I did that. But after three weeks, three months, or three years, you know, I got tired of just saying that every day, and I'm, I'm sure God got tired of it. So I just finally quit. I said, well, what'd you do then? I said, well, I basically backed away from church because I knew I shouldn't be there because I'm not living right. But sadder are the ones that never came to me, and they continue to live and call themselves Christians, but they're living in the midst of a Sodom and Gomorrah culture, and they've begun to adapt to it and even accept some of it, participate in it, and now they've seared their conscience, and although they can post on Facebook about uh, God has a plan for my life, and he'll rescue me, and I'm the only... Uh, light left in the dark, but he won't let that light go out and I hear it and I see it. And then I'll see those same people post things with curse words in it. What bothers me is not that they curse. And there's a lot of people, Christians that slip and say things they shouldn't, but they don't only have any conscience about it. They'll post it right next to the, uh, Isaiah 29. And then the next one, F this and F this. What are we doing? We're allowing ourselves to rise with the tide of an evil culture. Instead of maintaining what God said, and even though we can't meet the standard, we don't lower the standard. We pray, we continually bring it to God. You say, but how do I do that when I just can't, Brother Wes, I can't quit. I can, will he just keep forgiving me? Yes, he will. You see, this spiritual depression is only cured by God's grace. And if you'll keep coming to him, when he said, asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find, knocking it shall be open unto you. You want to get the door open to freedom? Those words are always in that future tense, which means perfect tense. It means keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. And God never gets tired of hearing you continue to knock. In fact, his own disciples want to know, what's the limit on forgiving people? He used a phrase that basically means you can't ever reach that limit. 70 times 7. Well, I like the way David said it over and over. His mercy endures forever. As long as you've not written it off, there's no mercy for unconfessed sin. In fact, if you take carefully 1 John 1, 9, we often miss something there. Most can quote it, but they don't realize there's something missing there. He said, if we confess, if we just confess our fault, He's faithful and just to forgive us. And he's the one who said, and then I'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, why didn't he say if we confess and change? Ultimately, we want to, but only God can change us. But he never can or will if we stop confessing. But did you realize all he's asked us to do is confess? Be honest. Don't change the standard because you can't meet it. And guess what? 
God's Mercy Clinic is open 24-7, 365 days a year. You can keep coming back to him as long as you're honest and say, God, I'm still struggling with this, but I'm not going to cauterize my conscience. I'm not going to allow this to become something that I just swallow so deep inside that I'm living with unexplained depression. I'm going to confess it to you. Can I share this with you? I have been many, many times to AA meetings. I've had my struggles too. You say, well, Brother Wes, you know, I remember this old-fashioned preacher saying, we don't need AA, you don't need 12 steps. Oh, you just need Jesus. Well, hold up, hold up. Jesus is in a lot of those rooms. Because really the principle, the biblical principle that works, the reason people go, the reason that people have got set free from addictions is because there's a biblical principle at work in AA that often is abandoned in churches. And that is this. What they are doing is simply confessing. And that confession not only unloads their burden, but it gives hope to others. Yes, they talk about their failures. And even when they've uh, been clean for two, three years and suddenly they fall, there's more mercy there than there is in most churches. They're the ones that are going to get the most hugs at the end. Don't give up. Don't give up. Now, they don't go running down to bar rooms to grab somebody off a bar stool and say, don't go give up. But those who are confessing, those who are being honest and saying, you know what, this is how I struggle. This is how it would happen. And there is a freedom in that, a freedom from depression. But as long as you ignore confession and being honest with God and with others, then there is the seedbed, the environment, a very evil Petri dish for depression to begin to grow. Like David said, it was a groaning in my spirit every day until I acknowledged my sin, I confessed it, and he delivered me. I believe there are too many. In fact, one of my burdens is preachers that I've known personally who quietly and secretly suffered in depression, primarily because they had their struggles, but who can you share it with? And I'm a pastor, I'm not supposed to have these problems, so I'll put on my religious smile and say enough amens and uh, use the gift God gave me and pray to God nobody ever finds out what I'm suffering through. And now we're finding out they're committing suicide. And that's why I'm reaching out to you today. I know what it is to suffer depression. I know what it is to cover a struggle for so long that it created depression where I didn't want to live. But when I confessed, acknowledged my sin, then he heard my cry. Did it happen overnight? And was there still continuing struggles? Yes, just like you know there are in your life, if you'll be honest. But if you never quit, he won't quit on you. I don't care how many times you fall and relapse. Stay honest before God. Don't use that as an excuse. Just simply come back and say, Father, I know what your word says. And I'm not meeting that standard. I need your grace. I need your help. And I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to be honest with myself and with you. I want to pray with you today because I believe there are those that are listening to me right now. That from the moment I began to speak, you knew this was for you. You too have quietly, silently, and painfully suffered with depression in the dark. I'm not supposed to be depressed. I'm a prayer warrior. I don't want my kids to know this, and so we do everything we can to mask the pain instead of dealing with the problem. Simply confess it. Lord, I, I've kind of pushed this aside. I, I continue to do it because it doesn't bother me anymore. Lord, bring the bother back, the conviction back, the sweetness of that pain that says we have to deal with this. And then bring it back to God and say, and I will, with your help, by your grace. I know it may not happen tomorrow. I don't know when and how long it'll take. But I know my only hope is your grace, your mercy, that will change me so that I can be delivered from depression. 
Father, I ask right now in the name of Jesus for that individual whose heart is open. They're still listening, Father, and it may be painful even to receive what they've heard, but they know it's truth. And if they would just turn their heart to you in honesty and open confession, say, Lord, this is what your word says. This is not what I am, but I thank you for your love, for your mercy, and I'm never going to quit. I won't change the definition of sin. I won't eliminate it through blame, denial, or dismissal. I'll confess it to you. And I'll be so thankful that your mercy endures forever. Because that's the only way I will be delivered from depression. God bless you.